Great. Well, we're, we're glad to be back with you guys and, um, you know, we, we want to share a little bit of our work um, and, you know, we'll, we're, we'll present it, but we want to leave it open as a conversation too. So if, if you see anything, any questions pop up, just feel free to interrupt us and, um, or you can put it in a chat and, um, and we'll try to kind of address those as we go. Um, you know, as we're thinking about what, what we wanted to share, um, we, we were thinking about the, the idea of scale and the way that that comes into play in design, um, you know, both the scale of the person inhabiting a space and also the, the scale of a building in its, its context. And so we're, we're gonna share two projects with you um, that are, are on kind of completely different scales. So I'll talk a little bit about um, one that we're doing downtown Oakland and then Fabi's going to share about a uh, much bigger project that is uh, on the peninsula. So with that, I will start sharing um, sharing my screen. I don't know if that works. Are you seeing? Perfect. We do see it. OK. I'll just put this in the presentation mode. So this is a project that that we are working with Mercy Housing on. And Mercy is a, a, an organization that um, builds affordable housing and they also run affordable housing projects and, and uh, support services. Um, and so they came to us uh, with this site, um, which is, if you guys know Uptown Oakland, this is, um, Telegraph Avenue that you know runs out of Oakland and all the way up to Berkeley and then this is 22nd Street and 21st Street and I'm just showing a couple image here images here of, of what it looks like this is actually a, an image I believe from our office looking out down at the site um, and Mercy owns this big building on the corner this building was built I believe in 1914 I think as as a YMCA and then in the 60s, it was converted into a bunch of housing um, units, um, small, small residential units. And, and Mercy took over kind of the operation of that building. So when they came to us, they have this empty parking lot next door. And they wanted to know, you know, what could we build here? How many, how many more um, apartments could we make on that space? And so we started brainstorming with them um and tried a couple of different configurations to see um just see how many we can fit um so one of the the important things that we had to consider early on was the context of the neighboring buildings so on on the left was that building I was describing the YMCA and on the the right is the um Julia Morgan designed First Baptist Church. Uh, you know, one of the steps in getting these, these projects realized is, is to go to, um, you know, the, the planning board and the planning board is going to tell you whether or not what you're trying to build is appropriate for the context. Um, so there's two things that we, have to respond to. And one is, is what's happening on Telegraph, which is a very sort of commercial corridor. You see a lot of office buildings, mixed use buildings. Um, and then on 22nd Street, we also have um, smaller houses, uh, duplexes and single family houses. And so the, the, the building that we were proposing was, was trying to respond to both scales and sort of turn the corner. So we start at sort of 85 feet and then drop down to 65 feet. Um, and, and the idea would be that all of, all of the upper part, part of the building would be um, housing for seniors. And then on the ground floor, we would have services for seniors. So they need to, they need help with, you know, cashing their checks or getting their medication, then everything would be on site for them. Um, this is, this is just kind of a little axon of, of what we were proposing on the first round. Um, 
So in addition to the housing and the services, we also wanted to make a little bit of green space for them, uh, some outdoor space that, that the people living there could, could take advantage of. And so we were proposing to make a little bit of a deck above and then also what we're calling a muse. And it's really just a shared outdoor space between the two buildings. Um, so this was kind of the first, the first design that we had um, come up with. And you, know, you can see sort of how it's stepping and so forth, but we also were trying to think about what's the right material for the outside. Um, we have existing buildings that are already made of uh, brick and other masonry, um, like there's large sandstone on the, on the church next door. Uh, so we wanted to do something that, that could respond to that, but maybe in a little bit more um, contemporary or up-to-date sort of way. So th this design was actually looking at doing porcel porcelain tile on the main part of the building. And then we could use sort of metal, um, metal panels that would also take colors and cues from the houses that were on on the um, on 22nd Street. And then the first floor would have kind of a, a darker, more Savo looking looking uh, base. So, you know, we we had multiple studies of, of this piece of the building where we're trying to just find the right right color, right texture. Um, you know, so, something that that felt like it it belonged in this space. So you could see here are some of the samples of um, of the uh, materials that we were looking at, and you know, we like to sort of just test this out on portions of the building to see how it how it feels. So here you could see, you know, this this idea of using terracotta, which is basically clay tiles. And it's, it's used on a building around the corner that, um, that we also designed. Uh, but you can also start to see how changing the scale of that tile really changes the feel of the building. Um, you have this very sort of fine grain pattern on the right, which, you know, from a distance, you may not see that at all. But as, as you get closer to the building and light starts raking across this, we thought you could get pretty interesting shadow effects uh, by simply adding a little bit of a fold to each of those tiles. So that's it at a small scale. And then, you know, what happens if we sort of double the scale of those tiles? And there's always limitations when you're picking a material, how big you can make it, how heavy it's going to become and, and how it gets hung on the building. But um, you know, the, the way to sort of test this out is, you know, for one thing, you know, we can do these renders, we can um, do these sort of zoomed in views of it. And then also, you know, try to get, get our hands on a physical sample and actually take it out into the sunlight, look at it and, and see how it looks in, in real context, um, you know, maybe up against uh, a neighboring building. Um, you know, there's, there's no way to, completely recreate what the building will look like in the end, but we can sort of do these studies to, to um, get a pretty good sense of how it, it might express itself. Um, yeah, so as far as colors, we are looking at um, a lot of the buildings that are within a few blocks of here. And, and there was a, a, a good amount of variety um, and we wanted to sort of reflect that somehow in the building. Um, so th this striping that you can see here, maybe I can minimize this, it is taking cues from um, some of the brick. There's this great, uh, uh, I believe this was, uh, I forget the name of this building, but it's it's got this great uh, kind of, heavy green facade. And so we we're trying to get some of those colors in there as well. And then as we walk down the street, we could see, um, you know, variations in, in the houses uh, on 22nd Street that we, we thought would be very interesting to bring, bring in as well. 
And so we start developing kind of this, um, this palette of colors that could then be, you know, applied um, in these in these stripes onto this, uh, this sort of lower portion of the 22nd Street facade. Um, and then we are also we're looking at at um, ways to screen in this this upper um, corridor. This is kind of a one sided corridor, um, and and bring some kind of a, a feeling of verticality to this portion. And, and we we thought you know parts of this could also come back into play at the entry where we have this nice sort of double height space to, to announce where the entry of the building is and, and give kind of a, a more of a grand feeling for, for the residents as they come into the building. Or what kind of material is that? The vertical so, span that you have? Yeah, so, so those, these are just aluminum channels um, that uh, would be painted uh, to, to sort of look like wood. Um, you know, wood is great to bring into buildings, uh, but it's always a challenge when you have it on an exterior because it 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 tends to uh, bleach out in the sun um, and requires some maintenance. Uh, you know, you'd have to kind of come back and retreat it, restain it to keep the the same color. Whereas uh, if we you do it out of aluminum, aluminum is nice and light. It's easy to work with and um, you wouldn't have to, to maintain it to the same degree. And that's why we kind of were gravitating towards this material. So this is just um, a snapshot of kind of each of the floor levels. Um, you know, the, the ground floor, which was, you know, as I said before, it was going to have sort of community rooms. It's going to have some support spaces. It'll have a bike room, um, and initially we we're even looking at maybe trying to get some parking into this ground level. Uh, and then the second floor would get um, a, a lot of units, but also some some common outdoor space. Uh, and then the floors would sort of continue up like this uh, from levels two through five, and then on level six, you can see again, we get more open space. The issue with the way we had designed this is that, um, you know, developers need to consider efficiency. And so they look at a ratio of how much actual living space do I have versus how much space am I giving over to, um, circulation, like the corridors and how you move around the building or giving over to um, support services or back of, back, I call them back of house services. It's like those rooms that you, you don't typically uh, spend a lot of time looking at, but uh, we often have like a boiler room or um, a pump room, uh, especially when you have a tall building, you have to like pump the water up, um, up to the roof to, to get it circulating around. Um, and I think with, with this, this scheme, we ended up having a lot of inefficiencies because we have these, uh, you know, what, what you would call a single loaded corridor up here, um, versus this is called a, a double loaded corridor where you have one corridor and it's being fed, uh, you know, from both sides to units. So we had to go back and redesign this, um, to try to get it to, uh, fit fit the budget a little bit better. And so what we ended up doing is taking the typical footprint and this became uh, the typical floor for everything above. And then we also took the same footprint down onto the ground level. So rather than have a, um, an outdoor space on level two, we would have a, a courtyard space on level one. I know that's a, a lot I just threw out there, please. Um, jump in if you have any questions on on any of that. We, uh, there is a question on the chat uh, was asking regarding to like timeline for like these modifications that you guys are making. Yeah, so ideally, um, you know, in the life of a project, you, 
you, you sort of have this concept phase in the beginning. Um, and, and once you kind of settle on a direction, you, you go into schematic design where you start trying to lay out all of the, the bits of, of program into the building. Um, and you know, that's, that's sort of typically when we present it back to the city and ask them for feedback as far as whether it's appropriate. Um, and ideally, all of this is worked out before you go to the city because you don't want to get approved for something and then have to go back and get approved again. Unfortunately for this project, that's sort of exactly what happened, uh, <laughs> where we, we, we thought we were pretty far along with the design, and then we found out we have to up the efficiency of, of, um, of the building. So um, does, does that answer the question? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, meanwhile, you know, so part of the expense is, you know, what does it take to build the building? But then it's also, what does it take to run the building? Um, and so Mercy started asking us about the neighboring building and whether we can reconfigure this building so that the main entry is in that muse space between the two buildings. So we did a couple quick studies for that. And we ended up basically redesigning the whole entry experience so that everybody would come through a common gate off of Telegraph and come into the building from the side. And what that allowed them to do is have one person sort of watch the gate for both buildings, mm. um, which ends up being a big savings over time because that's, that's someone's full-time job, you know? So you're, you're paying somebody 40 hours a week to, to sit there and paying one person versus paying two people over the life of the building, they're going to save hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that made a big difference. But um, you know, I, I think we actually improved the building and and the experience of the building by by making this shift um, because now we have this nice kind of common outdoor space, um, and then you can come into the building past the desk clerk. We'd have sort of a lounge space with a mail area, but we'd also have a large common room that could open up into this area. And um, get rid of this. Um, and it could also open up into the courtyard space. And so when they have really large events, um, sorry, let's see if that comes back. <laughs> I don't know if you get these, Fabi, but <laughs> all the time. Uh, let's see if it'll come back. It's part to of okay. the experience of virtual meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, so 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 we ended up, you know, obviously we cut out like some of that ground floor, and so we're having to condense the program on on this building, and then you can see the upper floors stay pretty much the same, and then instead of having that that space on the sixth floor, we are proposing to make another a roof terrace for some additional outdoor space for the residents, um, and I, I think once you get up this high, you'll be about eighty five feet in the air. And you'll be able to look all the way back to the bay, um, see the Bay Bridge, and you'll also be able to look out and probably see, you know, bits of bits of uh, Lake Merritt and the, the Oakland Hills as well. So we think this will be a pretty nice experience for, for the residents. Um, we also spent a lot of time looking at, at windows and, you know, what's the right size window for the space? Uh, these are really, really small little units. These are meant for one person. Um, and because they are so tight, we, we felt it was really important to keep the ceilings very high and keep a lot of light coming into the space. Um, so this is, you know, part of, part of those window studies that we were doing. Um, the shape of the building has changed now, right? Because we used to have the, the terrace area here, here. So we spent some time trying to think about how to express this this new volume. Uh, do we do something like this where the building peels back and you know once again you acknowledge kind of the the smaller scale of the residence? Uh, just a couple of views of that. Um, 
do you change materials maybe uh, after the second floor or third floor so that uh, another datum is kind of established at that lower residential scale? Um, at the end of the day, we ended up going with uh, this more solid facade, but uh, we, we felt like we can get a lot of variation in playing with the colors of the materials. So here you could see another sort of set of studies that we did on, on just the palette. And so we're thinking that this is basically stucco or, or you know, pl cement plaster. Um, and you can, you can color it almost anything you want. Um, but we thought it'd be interesting if there was subtle variations in, this, in the shade of it. And also if, if the base color sort of reflected what was happening uh, with with the uh, Hamilton building next door. Uh, and texture, you know, we always always go back to, to texture too. And, and um, switching from, if you recall at the beginning, we were looking at this little bit more premium material, the, the terracotta. Um, this is this is high density cement board. Um, so you know, and, and you can get a whole variety of, of different qualities of it. Uh, but we, we thought it was interesting that you could get some of that ribbed effect that, that we were trying to get out of the terracotta. Um, and then, you know, there's always a question too about, do you want to express the fasteners? Uh, you know, that's, it's, it's one of the main things we think about is just materials and their connections, you know, do you want to show them off with sort of these rivets or do you want it to be completely hidden and, and have concealed fasteners? And it all comes down to sort of what, what the, the main idea of, of the design is, um, you know, uh, what, what you're trying to express with the design. Um, and we also thought that, you know, stucco doesn't have to be boring. You know, you, you do see it a lot, but, um, there's also different ways that people have used it sort of sculpturally, um, these nice rounded edges. And, you know, there's a, a really interesting thing happening here where it turns in and sort of peels back away from this, this opening. Um, so, so, you know, this slide was really more to just remind ourselves not to be afraid of engaging with this material, uh, even though sometimes it's thought of as, as kind of a, a more um, inexpensive solution. So this is kind of where we are today. Um, and you can kind of see the old um, proposal with the new proposal. Um, and, and we're getting into that, um, that Muse entry experience and trying to think about you know, what does it have to do for the building? What is the character we want it to convey? Um, and, you know, with gates and entries, it's always a, a, a bit of a balance between feeling protected uh, from, you know, the, the general public, you know, we don't want everyone to be able to walk back here. But we also want there to be a feeling of transparency. Um, and, you know, at least let people look in and, and see there's there's life behind there. There's there's interesting things happening. So, you know, we we started a series of studies that sort of looked at uh, what that screening element could be. So it could be something as simple as these um, steel bars, uh, sort of like what you see here, where it, it's very much you know visually it's very much open, but it would be hard for for people to make their way through that um, we also looked at sort of patterns of perforation that we could uh, bring bring in as well by you know with a, a metal screen or do you you know try to use something that's more natural wood materials um, so this is this is still under development and and uh, you know kind of an ongoing discussion um, but you can see how it kind of changes the character of the space as we start to, to um, use different materials. Uh, this, is, this is kind of a concept plan of the landscape. And uh, we're just trying to create 
a few different areas for the, the residents to um, hang out out here in the space. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we were thinking about opening up the community room so it can connect to this outdoor space. Um, and so it's, it's, it's kind of a, a balance of, you know, what's the right amount of, of planting and trees to bring in, uh, but still allow some good visibility for the people who, who need to sort of monitor the front door. Um, so that, that's like kind of the ground floor landscape plan. And then, um, then this is the roof terrace landscape plan. Um, you know, this is still very early, but you know, the idea here would be that we'd create a, a series of different zones. So, you know, maybe people want to hang out and eat here or, you know, want to come up and read. And so you kind of have almost a series of, of like living rooms that would happen on the roof deck. Um, yeah, this is just kind of a, a zoom in of, of that chain. So, so this is the same material going up, except, you know, here we see some of the ribbed panels and here we see some of the flat panels. And this sort of sets up a line that responds to um, a, a datum that was also on the neighboring um, Hamilton. So it's, it's kind of trying to acknowledge without copying that building, but um, you know, taking cues from that. So here it is without the ribs. And then here you can see a very subtle kind of, it's picking up kind of this decorative band that happened up here. And then we have a second band that is responding to this, um, this higher brow that's happening on, on, the, um, on the Hamilton. And yeah, and then this is just a, a nighttime render of, um, of the building and you can see sort of the variation of color that we, we put on on the, the um, 22nd Street facade and then also the way that these kind of windows uh, wrapped with these these kind of metal um, surrounds start to, to set themselves off and um, they're not actually really deep windows but we've, we felt that by doing this wrap it would it would give a sense of depth uh, to that facade. So I think that's about all I have on this project. Um, Mark, I noticed so in your other... you you showcase uh, different kinds of plans, both landscape plans and also layout plans and so forth. Do you, does Gensler uh, work with subcontracting landscape plans, or is that something that you guys do in house as well? Well, it's it's actually something we have the capability of doing. But for this particular project, we worked with PGA Design, um, and and they helped us develop that that landscape concept. Very cool. Students, any questions regarding to what Mark just presented? Give them a few minutes to chat. Yeah. I mean, feel free to, you know, if you want to follow up with email questions too, you know, be happy to, to you know, share whatever information. Um, Mark, I'm, I, I love hearing the stories of the materiality studies for this building because it makes you think about how the, the rigorous studies that happen on all the buildings around you, right, whether it's in your neighborhood and other cities. Uh, and so it's, it's good to, whenever we go outside, to reflect back and see, see buildings and start to study as to why they chose materials to that extent and look in the surroundings and see, oh, it, it's trying to connect back to the other buildings around them, you know. Yeah, that's so, a great point. Yeah. Taking it's, that reflection. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think in, when you when you start putting your head into design, it's like you never you never stop learning and you never stop looking, you know, even walking around my neighborhood, there's always things that, you know, I see for the first time or notice for its first time that, you know, was was obviously some someone had made that decision and decided to express that building that way. And it's it's pretty pretty fun to look at the city through that that lens. Yeah, going I'll off go ahead and stop sharing. And... Perfect. Going off going off what uh, Fabius referred to, which is like I love the fact that you guys are showcasing like uh, a, a true understanding of like the context, right? Understanding how what the building where the building is sitting in and taking consideration of the context, understanding material, understanding colors, and just taking into consideration everything, even height showcasing like height difference and the, 
the, the residential side versus the commercial side and just being able to kind of bleed everything in. Of course, there's so many factors at play that restructure the, the final shape of it. But I really enjoy being able to hear that like in every great design, there's that consideration for the people who's living in the, in the site and, and the context that is being uh, settled in. So I really appreciate that a whole lot. So thank you for, for showcasing that and shedding light on that. Yeah, thank you. And that's kind of a great segue into a building that doesn't have <laughs> doesn't have the same contextual considerations. So uh, that's very true. <laughs> well, hi everyone. My name is Fabiola Catalan. I am an interior designer at Gensler. I wasn't here last time, but I'm excited to join you guys today. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit about one of my favorite projects I've worked on for the past five-ish years. <laughs> so I know uh, ISIS had a question in regards to building timeline. It all varies, right? Uh, depending on how big or what the scale is of the project. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and, and talk about uh, the headquarters of NVIDIA. Okay, can you guys see my PDF? We can. Great. Uh, so this is the headquarters of NVIDIA, and NVIDIA, um, before I go into the details of the projects, I wanted to tell you a little bit about who they are. And so I guess my first question, and you guys can add it in the chat, is how many of you guys play video games? Because I do. <laughs> me, 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 me. I see a bunch of me's. <laughs> so behind every video game, there is a company that builds graphic cards to provide the rendering services or the speed as to how fast the video is created. And so NVIDIA is the company that creates these cards, these graphic cards to create the power, the rendering and the speed of the video games. And so all the video games you play have some sort of connection to NVIDIA. So that's a fun fact about them. Uh, and so they are located in Santa Clara and they have a large campus out there. And back in 2012, they had a design competition where they reached out to a few architectural companies to compete on a design for their new headquarters or new office. And so we competed and we won. And so from there, we started the uh, process of the journey of designing what their headquarters could look like and what that means. And so this is a picture of the final building. So <laughs> spoiler alert, uh, you know what it looks like. But just to give you an idea of scale, this is 500,000 uh, square feet, not including the two floors of parking underground. So you're looking at almost a million square feet in this building. Um, so if I were to show you a floor plan, right, a little bit of a, a shock, and it's huge, it takes forever to load, so you'll see that. Uh, this is the ground floor. This is level one, right when you come in off the street. It's a little daunting. I won't go into the details, but overall, to give you an idea, the first floor is about six football fields big. So this gives you an idea of how ginormous just this one floor is. And so the, the CEO of this company, uh, his name is Jensen, his big theory or concept for this building was to bring everyone together under one roof. And so before the campus had about four buildings within that same footprint of this triangular building, and we demoed all of those out and we built this huge campus where he wanted everyone to be able to meet and casually like run into each other down the hallway or in the pantry. And so that's where this huge building came, came to life. Um, this building has about three floors. It has two large floors similar to the what I'm showing here. And then it has a mezzanine floor. And I'm gonna bring down the scale and talk about a specific area because I primarily worked on just the interior and the experience that the staff uh, goes through and feels as they go through the space. Uh, and so one of the areas I really want to talk about, and I'll show you this section cut of this building from the early on design is the heart. We called it the heart. So we built a, um, a huge shell within a shell that housed all of the social areas. And 
uh, through working with the client, one of the big things was how do we create areas for work? Because they have a lot of engineers and after doing a lot of visioning sessions with them, they really want quiet and focus. But then how do we integrate a space that is more private, more secluded, where everyone can gather to socialize, hang out, eat food, have a good time, kind of unwind, and then go back to work. And so that is where the heart of this building was developed. And as you see in this section cut, you can see the two ground level uh, parking. You see the uh, actual level one, the ground floor, uh, level two, and then that bleeds into the, mez into the heart and then the mezzanine level. And so the heart, before I show you pictures of what that looks like, our concept behind that was to really create a sense of privacy and protection. So this building is so big. And so how do you, as an individual that's like five feet, six foot tall, right? How do you feel um, safe or how do you feel intimate in this ginormous building? And so really working with the scale, working with comp compacting, compacting and compressing uh, and, and pretty much expanding. And so the mezzanine really created, the heart really created this idea of compacting and creating a little nest of privacy and protection looking at the geometry and really playing with that and emphasizing the look and feel and uh, creating some faceted geometric shapes to really make it a feature of the space to bring people into the heart. And so here is some images of how it looks like today. And so this picture down below, this is right when you walk in from the street you see the heart, right? It's the first thing you see when you walk in. And some detail shots of how the heart opens up, the, the facade opens up to um, show the bridges coming through and kind of the peekaboo areas of the, the bench seating and kind of the social aspects of inside and out. So if I, if I zoom in even more, right? Go down and scale even more. And I jump into the mezzanine floor, which is the top floor. This is the floor where the client really wanted to have the hub, where he wanted everyone to hang out when they want to socialize, uh, but really create a variety of amenities to give the staff options, right? To give them uh, options to where they want to hang out. And so a funny story behind this one floor, it went through probably five or six iterations. And that is the great thing of, about design is that uh, it, you can, there's never ending, right? There's so many options out there. So we started off with making this more of a meeting space originally with a lot of conference rooms, small, medium, large uh, boardrooms to making it more of a food program so then changing it to what's diagrammed here, where it's a combination of three elements. One, the great room, which has a, a coffee brew bar. Uh, so it feels more like a restaurant, uh, a library wellness area that has a hydration bar like water or uh, cucumber infused water. They were big fans of that. Um, and then the other one is the game room, right? Because you can't be a part of NVIDIA and not have video game room, right? Uh, so that's part of the fun. Uh, and just a little uh, heads up on the game room, it actually got removed and it became more of a, a, a social meeting space because they needed more of that. So they relocated this program elsewhere. elsewhere. That gives you an idea of how we were able to divide the space to create multiple programs. So if we jump into a quick plan of how that looks like, we have this center area here, which is the atrium, and that opens up all the way up to the roof, and they have a variety of skylights. So that brings in a lot of the natural light in the center of the space and in the heart, which would typically be very dark. Uh, it's actually extremely bright. <laughs> um, so in the uh, in this space, we have more of the lounge, casual, impromptu gatherings for meetings for teams to come in hang out, study, or brainstorm the next project together in an open environment. This blue area is more of the library where it's very much closed up to create a, an area of, of quietness, of focus time. If someone, a team needs to come in and really just focus for like two, three days to get a project done or a deadline done, or really just one one-on-one uh, -on -one or individual work. Uh, and then this uh, orange area 
uh, is probably the most fun in this space is this is the coffee bar. And so from what we've heard from the client, everyone hangs out here now. Uh, and this is where they have a combination of coffee and beer uh for their staff <laughs> uh, as well as food so they can bring food from the cafeteria as well as provide food here one of the studies i wanted to show you guys about this cat this uh this bar is the study of the volume uh and so i'll show you this now so the height was still there we had a large height and we studied a lot on do we integrate elements in the ceiling? Do we play with the facets of this uh, eyebrow above the bar? And how do we work, modify it to one, provide overhead in the food area because we need a cleanable surface for food area in the ceiling, but still make it really interesting. And so we, we looked at a variety of different modifications uh, and scales and proportions to figure out what it could be. Um, so we ended up liking this more uh, symmetrical faceted eyebrow to really mimic what's going on with the facets of the heart. Uh, and again, bring it back to a smaller scale <laughs> for an individual. And so these are just some um, material studies that we started doing. These are the early on material studies we started doing. Do we bring in a little bit of warmth? So the, 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 the majority of the building is very white, very black with like black stainless steel, white metal, white paint. There's very little wood in the project. And that was definitely driven by the client and the architects working together in collaboration. Uh, the client was very adamant that they wanted more of a simple, sophisticated, timeless space, S looks futuristic. And so and he didn't want any color. And so that became very challenging in the space because it started feeling very stark. And so when we started to explore the social areas in this within this heart, we felt it was needed to uh, start to incorporate more textures, more colors uh, in order to bring in that warmth and really that inviting feel in the space. And so we started introducing a lot of the, the walnuts and the oaks and bringing in some textures like uh, soapstone and uh, a lot of fabric that have like nubby textures in order to really give this a true warmth experience and a completely different experience that you would see elsewhere. And so uh, here's another study of that. So when we looked at furniture, you could see a lot of that. We start to incorporate a lot of the black, right, to mimic back to the architecture. But we also brought in a lot of the woods, a lot of wood details that are softer curved around to really bring in that experience. Uh, and then I wanted to show you the library. So within the library, we also started bringing that experience as well, um, bringing in a lot of the wood, uh, still keeping uh, a lot of that dark metal feel from the overall project. Um, started to bring more texture in a pattern form. So everywhere within this building, um, it's tied back to a specific triangle shape. And so the columns are um, organized where they hit the point of, of corners of that triangle. And so, so <clears throat> we, we took that inspiration that was actually taken from NVIDIA's graphic card, right, because it's very triangular. So taking that and pretty much exploding it <laughs> everywhere in the building to use it to our advantage as a grid uh, to really define the spaces. And so architecturally, it's everywhere. And as well as this uh, feature wall, we were showing it as a more um, transformed triangular pattern. And as you can see, a lot of it is enclosed, some of it is open, really giving that different feel of work environments for the staff. Um, these are great, so Fabi. I just, I, I just wanted to yeah. um, commend you for, you know, when you put these, these shadow figures, people in here, it really helps to understand how big a space we're talking about here. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this brings it down to more of a human scale compared to the, the massive building. Uh, so let me share a, a little bit of the final photo so you get an idea of where it ended up. 
so as you can see here on the bottom right, this is the, uh, the great room, that bar. So we ended up changing the finish of that eyebrow to more of a um, ebony wood veneer. So it's like a black, black wood veneer. So it still has that wood texture, but it still mimics that dark color to the heart facade. So it really feels as it's a part of the heart. Uh, we brought in a lot of the copper finishes uh, to bring in that warmth, a little bit of different metal options, uh, having all of that walnut to really warm it up a little bit more. Uh, and having a variety of seating is, is key when it comes to a social space. You want to be able to have flexible seating and a variety. So those the users have options. We have this little room tucked in on the side. You see this white, white volume here on the back of it. It's, it's almost like a, a, a speakeasy or like a hidden room within this, uh, this, this uh, heart. And so you have to walk all the way around this white volume to then find this um, camel warm color leather <laughs> lounge experience. And then here on the left, you see uh, the, one of the libraries. So we, we rotated a lot of the furniture so it's more inviting uh, and it creates more of a, a smaller cluster of groups. So if people do end up meeting in these spaces, you don't have more than 10 people meeting at once and it could get a little loud. And then uh, allowing these little nook areas for people to just casually sit and read or do some heads down work. The last photo I wanted to share is the one of the main screens we did and not only was it designed to be beautiful and really mimic a lot of the architecture but it was also supposed to be functional um, because of this great room or this bar being a completely different program we had to separate it from everything else and there was a requirement from the city uh, so this was our solution to separate that space or to define the boundary of where that that starts and ends without really enclosing it with glass or walls. And so this was approved by the city, which we were so excited about because <laughs> uh, it allowed us to carry that same language throughout the space, still have a beautiful backdrop. And again, bring in that warmth into this heart to help the staff socialize and hang out. Uh, I see there's some questions. Uh, yes, the, the question from Isis, is she, in the heart of the building. This is the heart of the building. Yeah, so if I go back to this section. So this outline here is the heart. And this atrium runs, cuts right through the building. So the mezzanine is right here, this whole floor. And so the, the bar area would essentially be here. So that lives within the heart. We also had another question regarding to the building itself. Um, you mentioned yeah. that you mentioned that the building encompasses everyone's work uh, workspace, every other engineers and designers and so forth. Do you know if this space also is made for manufacturing the parts, or is it just for the design and and engineering of the parts? Yeah, great question. It it's also uh, there's a lot of labs in the space, and those labs were created for building all of the, the products as well. Uh, they also are huge on testing their products on newer things. And I know last time I was there before shelter in place, they had uh, a variety of cards, cars on the ground floor, testing all of their videos and um, what are they like the autonomous vehicle cameras to see how they could work together. So it's a it's a it's a lab. It's a shop. It's also a workplace or an office. So it's all of the above. <laughs> and and we're working on phase two of this too, right? We are, yeah. So the the building there's two buildings, and so the second building is being constructed now. It should be done by February of next year, uh, and that is. 750,000 square feet. So that's larger than this one, if you could believe it. Uh, so that, the second building will hold more than 3,000 people. Uh, and this one was shy of 3,000. So uh, yeah, 
the cool thing about the second one is that they're integrating a lot of outdoor experiences and we worked with hood design which is an uh, landscape architect and they've integrated these great outdoor spaces which we're calling the tree houses uh, where people can go out and and work together or work outside all day if they wanted to which i think is a great approach uh, now when we're thinking about heading back to work oh that's great actually yeah. walter hood was one of my thesis advisors in grad school so wow yeah he is a rock star he was great yeah, um, Karen asked if that, I'm assuming the second building, it's going to look futuristic. It's going to look futuristic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to have a very similar uh, building look style. So it's going to look uh, similar to this this one building, but larger. It has uh, technically four floors in, instead of three. Um, and so, and it's going to have more integrated landscape involved. Okay. So. We'll have to share that with you guys next time. Yeah, yeah, it's such a, a great roof that you have here that uh, it's it's rare to see a huge expanse like this that's not filled up with mechanical equipment and chillers and you know cluttered up with all the typical roof stuff. Yeah, we actually have a floor dedicated. So there's like uh, the mezzanine where we were looking at just now within the heart, but then there's also a mechanical mezzanine and that houses all of those guts that Mark is talking about. So we try to uh, not <laughs> mount those all over the roof. And walking on this roof is, I feel if if there was a time to walk on Mars, I feel like that is the feel. It, it, it was so surreal. It was just all white and bright uh, and all the uh, angles and undulations were really cool. It's a, such a cool experience to walk up there. How much, how many people are working on that project? So that's a great question. We had in the beginning about a, a team of 20 to 25 people. And the cool thing about this project is that we got to work with everyone within the firm. So we got to work with the LA office, the London office, the Chicago office, our Costa Rica office, um, our Oakland office, San Francisco office. So there was a huge a uh, huge team from all around the world working on this project. Uh, so in total, I think max, we were at 25. And as the project wrapped up and we were under construction, I think we were down to, to five people helping coordinate all of the construction with the general contractor. Uh, we have about three more minutes time frames because I want to respect you guys' time. Uh, we have about three more yeah. minutes. Any last questions uh, for, our, for our presenters? Nope. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. This project won a lot of awards uh, and what, one of the ones that's close and near dear to my heart was the uh, IDA or the International Interior Design Association uh, Award for Best Design, uh, essentially in, in internationally. So that was really cool. We were competing with a lot of great people and architects from all around the world. This is uh, incredible to see the different scale uh, from something a little bit smaller, still big, and then something extremely <laughs> yeah. large uh, and in the context of something completely different. And I think I want to say thank you so much for shedding light on just kind of like the design process, the design thinking process you guys go through. And at the end of the day, it's about the human interactions, the human experience. And you guys take that into consideration to to the extreme, right? So even in the clients and the case of uh, in the state in the uh, in the context of like in your case, uh, Fab uh, Fabi, regarding to like the client want something so stark, so clean, and yet you will still make it warm by bringing in textures, mm -hmm. bringing in colors, bringing in wood, bringing in just the fabric that people sit on. Uh, and I think that's something so incredible to think about is that as designers, we there's the human element to that, and I think you guys shed so much light on the consideration for that, the consideration for the interactions and the, and the experience people go through. Uh, and our students are kind of going through these courses and then and learning those cues and learning how material and colors and textures and shapes and size actually affects how we behave, how we feel, how we interact, how we experience. And, and I think that's something you guys have that's, uh, shed so much light on. And so we thank you so much for 
um, for doing that for our students and being here for our students and, and this time, especially this time. So thank you so much for being here and your presentation. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, we're really honored to, to be able to share time with you guys. And um, yeah, we just want to be a resource for you. So if you have questions about design or anything, you know, we, we're, we're happy to, um, you know, share whatever knowledge we have. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm happy to share my email if you guys have any questions. Sounds great. Uh, Mark, we will keep in contact. We'll continue having this discussion. Terrific, terrific. Amazing. Well, I know you guys are wrapping up your quarter, so I, I wish everybody luck in, in finishing up this, uh, this chunk of uh, your educational experience. Thank you so much again. Yeah. How do you start working in that company? <laughs> so we, do have, <laughs> we, do have a, we have a students who want to work for your company already. <laughs> great yeah join us <laughs> yeah yeah i mean in a typical year we usually have a lot of uh summer internship opportunities and i you know i think um yeah th this is a good way meet somebody in the company and <laughs> have them pull you in but um yeah, yeah that's that's a great point, Mark. Yeah, keeping those connections and knowing who's working, who works with the company that you like and reaching out to see how you can join, even if it's an internship or just shadowing. Shadowing goes a long way, especially in the beginning as you start jumping into your career. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much again. Um, and hopefully we'll see you guys soon again. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Appreciate everyone. It. Take care, everyone. Do this. Take around for a quick, a quick.